Hello everyone, I'll just be giving a small introduction to the author of this short story, Gold from the Grave, Tukaram Bhaurav Sate, popularly known as Anna Bhaurav Sate. He was born on 1st August 1920 and died on 18th July 1969. He is primarily associated with Dalit literature. His 35 novels, 10 folk dramas, 24 short stories, 10 poadas, one play and a travelogue have been published in Marathi by the Maharashtra government in 1998. His protagonists in the award-winning novel, Fakira, not only reclaim their identity, but also teach humanity and the value of forgiveness. Fakira won a Maharashtra State Government Award in 1961. In a ballad, Cha Girani Kamgar, mill worker of Mumbai, written in 1949, Sate traces the miseries of factory workers and captures the disparities between the rich and poor in Mumbai. A small excerpt from this ballad, there are divine-looking high-rise buildings on Malabar Hills, Indrapuri. There is a colony of Kuba. Rich people enjoy all material comforts. On the contrary, people living in Parel work hard day and night, eating whatever they get and sweat it out. Arti Wani describes two of his songs, Mumbai Chilavani, Song of Bombay, and Mumbai Chagirni Kamangar, Bombay's Milhan, as depicting a city that is rapacious, exploitative, total, exploitative unequal and unjust. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this discussion on Gold from the Grave. Uh, it's a story by Anna Bahusate and uh, it is a translation from Marathi by Vernon Gonzalez. Uh, that's the translation that we are working with for today's purpose. And the story is a bizarre story. Um, this story is comparable uh, in some respects uh, with the Prem Chans, The Shroud. Uh, we do have an eerie, uh, gothic uh, atmosphere which can be interpreted uh, in myriad ways. So what we are going to do today is um, concentrate on the first section of the story and um, my students here are going to take turns to join the discussion to unpack the bizarre uh, elements uh, of the story which deals with poverty-stricken uh, poverty landscape of Mumbai. So uh, I'll first uh, request uh, my student Cornelius to uh, pick out a passage uh, from the story which is really striking to him uh, as a reader. So the story is basically very uh, interesting and it's very realistic in sense because you get to know the uh, lifestyle between the rich and the poor within the story because uh, uh, you see that the protagonist who is Bhima is actually looking hard to find job in order to survive, in order to feed his wife and in order for him to find some money so that they can survive. Yeah. So the best thing, the best part that I liked in the story from the first section is uh, the paragraph which, say, which says, clothes under his arm, Bhima turned back from the quarry. On the way, he stopped at a stream. He bat there and prepared to make his way home, devastated beyond itself. It was then that his eyes fell on, on a mount of aces. There were the aces of a dead body. As he looked at the charred human bones, Bhima grew even more despondent. Must be some jobless, wretched, poor chap must have given up on life. I'll also die like this. Starvation will start in a couple of days. Then Nar Narbada will sit crying. My life will fall into a deep depression and there will be nothing I can do about it. And the next paragraph as well. Suddenly he saw something sparkling in the heap of ashes. When he looked closely, he discovered that a sparkle came from a gold ring of about a tola. Overjoyed, he grabbed hold of the ring, one tola of gold and that, and that took, took from a corpse's ashes. From found in the ashes of a corpse. He had found a new means by which to live. Okay, so yeah, these are very, very um, important moments in the first section of the story. So, so far we understand that he is a quarry worker, uh, he is a migrant too. He has migrated from a village to Mumbai to find work and he tries to make a living by breaking stones off a hill. 
and w until one fine day he loses the job because the quarry shuts down so that is the setup so far and on his way from that closed down quarry he comes across a mound of ashes and suddenly uh, he notices a, a burnt body and look at that um, set of ideas that from his mouth in fact that passage is what I would call free indirect discourse we can have the stream uh, we have the stream of consciousness of this particular protagonist here right uh, must be some jobless wretch poor chap must have given up on life I'll also die like this this is not the narrator this is Beamer's words uh, Beamer's voice coming through the narrator's pen right and then he says that Narbada will sit crying his uh, young daughter and my wife will fall into a deep depression and his family will basically self-destruct right it'll collapse so that is what um, he thinks until he comes across a, a, a tolo of gold a measure of gold and that's it his life makes a u-turn right he starts to make a business by trying to steal or by successfully stealing from uh, dead bodies right so uh, Catherine I was wondering if, if you have any thoughts about um, this section or this passage um, from the story um, I would like to comment a little more mm -hmm. on the setting of the story mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because right in the beginning, the author establishes a kind of intrigue, mm -hmm. the very first line and the second line where he says, hearing that a powerful money lender had died in a nearby village, Bhima sprang to his feet. He was exhilarated. Okay? So that itself makes the reader curious as to why this person, this protagonist is happy, so happy about the death of someone. Yeah. So he establishes that in the very first line that this is going to be a very unusual sort of a narrative, a very bizarre kind of a narrative. And then the third paragraph where there is a description of their living quarters, mm -hmm. I found that very interesting um, because you have 50 or so huts in the suburb, in the jungle, um, which creak in the breeze. And then he further describes the huts as being made of old tin sheets, mats, planks and sacks. And those houses contained people. So uh, he is almost he almost finds it strange that people live in such abysmal circumstances. Yeah. And yeah. the following line, I think, sort of sums up mm -hmm. uh, the the condition of mm -hmm. the people living there when he says, "Cast off things, sheltering a cast off people." Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I'll just make a point about that, and then we'll go back to that opening um, uh, set of ideas cast of things sheltering a cast of people we have the narrative commentary in the story so we don't have an objective narrator who is just detailing things out for the reader we have a narrator who is commenting on the status of this protagonist and his placement in the society so it is not a very uh, objective uh, neutral kind of description which is going on in the story so that is something that we need to uh, remember the repetition cast off uh, things cast off people associating people with cast off objects is also very very interesting the people themselves have been turned into objects which are worthless right so that idea is also very clearly uh, highlighted there and uh, Catherine you're quite right it's a very um, interesting opening if you uh, think about it um, and you, you, you rightly also point out that there is a kind of an intrigue or a curiosity that is provoked in the reader. It could almost be like a detective story in some respects as to um, when you're trying to answer the question, why is he happy about the death of a, a village, um, you know, a money lender, a powerful money lender, right? And I was also uh, jotting down notes while I was reading and, and I was just um, uh, pointing uh, to myself that there's an extreme of emotions, right? Uh, if, if you read the passage very clearly, Cl uh, closely hearing that a powerful moneylender had died in a nearby village Bhima sprang to his feet he was exhilarated and um, the next line his joy wouldn't subside he's not able to suppress his happiness looking in the direction of the village he suddenly turned to glare at the sun in the sky so he's glaring angrily at the sun in the sky one moment he is full of ecstasy joy exhilaration the other moment he's so angry he's glaring he's giving looks to the sky right and um, further down uh, if you look at the way the setting is described the way the landscape is described you can also see the emotions of this particular character kind of projected onto this particular um, aspects of the landscape uh, uh, let me just quickly read the second paragraph there the sun was setting 
Rain clouds crowded the sky. They had the rough, battered look of freshly ploughed land. When you look at freshly ploughed land, there's a, there's a quiet sense of joy and satisfaction, uh, peace. You kind of somehow sense the rhythm, the natural rhythm of, of uh, you know, civilization. So, but here, look at the way uh, the freshly ploughed land is described. It's rough. It's battered, as if somebody had beaten the land, right? So we can clearly realize that these are the emotions of this particular uh, protagonist. And look at the next line, the retreating light filtering through those nasty looking clouds, right? Nasty looking clouds. Again, that emotion which we associate with human beings and their aggressive attitudes is kind of offered for the clouds. So there's a transferred epithet there uh, in, in the description of natural scenery. And these stream down over Mumbai, right? The key setting. Right, so um, Mumbai already has been shown to us in a very kind of negative, uh, a pessimistic, harsh light. Right, and we also need to remember that this particular writer has written a lot on uh, the city of Mumbai and uh, if you uh, kind of think about the brief introduction that Guru Darshana, uh, kind of um, read for us, you will realize that um, the city, Mumbai becomes a dystopian place uh, for Anna Bausate and he describes the misery of that place, the misery that place inflicts on its inhabitants, its wretched inhabitants who are unfortunate enough to fall on the, uh, the uh, oppressed side or the exploited side of that uh, great divide between the rich and the poor. Right. And, uh, uh, this yeah. pattern of description, I think we find it throughout the mm -hmm. story, yes. where things which are uh, seemingly normal, mundane, quotidian mm -hmm. are juxtaposed mm -hmm. with things that are absolutely uh, abysmal, yeah. wretched yeah. Um, and uh, almost like um, a mockery of yeah. uh, humanity. Absolutely. So that two things coexist. So yeah. you have the kitchen fires burning, you have the children playing, mm -hmm. you have everyone going about their day to day business, yeah. but their lives are completely submerged in uh, poverty. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. which reminds me of this particular detail on page 107. Um, his beloved daughter Narbata was playing close by, right? Um, as you pointed out, the real mundane day to day existence of child's play, and his wife was in the house patting buckers into shape, preparing food, right? So, all these uh, quotidian or, or, or uh, regular routine is ongoing. And Bhima even looks awe-inspiring. If you look at that description um, of Bhima, he's awe-inspiring. His satara outfit comprised a long red turban, a yellow dhoti, a shirt of thick coarse cloth. Uh, he looked a proper wrestler, right? His massive forehead, thick neck, dark eyebrows, flamboyant moustache, and broad yet fiery features had struck fear into many ruffians. So he is a fearful, uh, uh, you know, physical presence in the story. Uh, we have the softness of the child and the wife gently playing, doing their work, which is contrasted once again with this really powerful, uh, you know, specimen of masculinity, uh, fearful specimen of masculinity as well. So uh, you're quite right in pointing out the the really stark contrast. And uh, this story is is also about a contrast between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have not. And usually the story is associated with um, you know, uh, uh, kind of illustrating the life of a Dalit, but I wouldn't kind of kind of put this into that compartment and say yes, uh, this is kind of uh, exemplary of that kind of uh, uh, lifestyle. I would just say that this could apply to every human being who is kind of uh, is in the margins and who is trying to strike out a uh, living by hard work. And I want to point out uh, once again to the setting of this story, uh, which is in the suburb, um, not in the town, not in the city. If you go back to the other stories um, that we have read, particularly the blue light, if you remember the setting of that uh, house, Bargavinilayam, it's again in near the borders. <coughs> Right, it's it's near the municipality border. It's not in the hustle and bustle of town. Once again, um, you know, uh, m what what we have here is kind of marginalization of certain people and certain settings, right? And which in itself has a lot of ideological implications that we can probe. So uh, setting is interesting. It's in the suburbs, and it's it's just a kind of um, you know hovel, 
with lots of people huddling close together like that crowd of clouds in the sky, right? People living cheek by jowl and, and, and crowded settings and setups are there uh, very clearly to indicate that there is overcrowding and therefore that could also be one of the economic reasons for such a deprived lifestyle, right? Uh, my question here is to um, Catherine. I was just um, wondering about this phrase. Um, if you go back to page 107, as his many dreams of getting a job, becoming a worker, bringing home a pay packet, making his wife a coin necklace was shattered, Bhima had lost hope and had moved to the suburb in the jungle. Right? So he is a villager and then he couldn't make uh, ends meet there. So what he does is um, he migrates to Mumbai and um, he has moved to the suburb in the jungle. Why this word jungle, right? Uh, uh, you know, when you first read it, you really wonder if this is a real jungle, if there's a real wilderness, right? What are your thoughts on this? Maybe you can make a comment on it. Um, I think the setting that's been described so far is a typical slum mm -hmm. or a basti mm -hmm. in Mumbai. And uh, as you'd already pointed out, uh, there are people from different castes, different religions and different communities who are like jostling mm -hmm. together and then they are uh, struggling to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. So it, it has become a jungle in the sense that it is each man or woman for himself and herself and it's a struggle to find work mm -hmm. and there is a lot of competition mm -hmm. and uh, he creates this um, scenario where uh, uh, human, human beings might not necessarily um, be human. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think this is a prelude to what mm -hmm. happens later on in the yes. story when a certain animalistic kind of instinct takes over for survival. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the word jungle mm -hmm. is very significant in that you have this um, fight for survival absolutely. and also diminishing uh, humanity. Yes, yes, really absolutely, really. absolutely. So the jungle is a metaphoric uh, way to represent the suburb of Bombay um, uh, or Mumbai where, uh, you know, civilized values and civilized uh, uh, way of life takes a back seat and animalistic tendencies come to the fore. So uh, once again, the city and the suburbs are portrayed in a really, really harsh and uh, um, you know, uh, uh, wild manner, right? The wildness becomes real as the story progresses and there's a foreshadowing of things to come. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Cornelius. Aparna, uh, would you like to read um, the passages that you find uh, striking in the story? Yes, sure. So uh, the most interesting paragraphs I found from the story is uh, just after where Cornelius stopped reading. Uh, I'll read it out once again. Suddenly he saw something sparkling in the heap of ashes. When he looked closely, he discovered that the sparkle came from a gold ring of a boated tola. Overjoyed, he grabbed hold of the ring, one tola of gold and that too from a corpse ashes. He was delighted by his dis discovery. There was gold to be found in the ashes of a corpse. He had found a new means by which to live. From the next day onwards, Bhima began visiting crematoriums and cemeteries on the banks of the rivers and streams. He would sift through the ashes of bodies and pick up a fragment of gold here, an ornament there, earrings, nose rings, a gold chain, bracelet or anklet, he would find something of value every day. Bhima's new venture began to flourish. He discovered that gold ornaments which were left on the bodies that were being cremated would melt and melt with the heat of the fire and enter the bones. So he would crush burned bones and remove the gold. He would break skulls. He would crush wrist, but he would get the gold. In the evening, he would go to Kurla, sell the gold and collect cash. On the way home, he would get dates for Narbada. Business was steady. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, now, I would uh, invite Amrudala to offer some comments on the passage that uh, Aparna has read for us. It's a very interesting passage. And uh, what strikes, uh, strikes the most is that somebody's death becomes a means of living yeah. for another person. 
and um, and the how the the, the, the the how he describes about when he discovered the spark came from a gold ring of about a tola it's like a precious jewel that is going to mm -hmm. uh, 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 help help him to uh, lead a life mm -hmm. so uh, gold becomes very important here and uh, and that too it's kind of bizarre that somebody collects gold from some uh, corpses ashes and um, um, like we don't we actually it does not come to us that you can make mm -hmm, a living out mm -hmm, of it mm -hmm. so um, first time i'm coming across something yeah. of this sort yeah and uh, another thing that uh, i have uh, noted is that is the stark uh, difference of uh, uh, the different sides of bima mm -hmm. that is mentioned here mm -hmm. uh, and uh, towards the la uh, towards the last of this passage you can see uh, uh, he, the writer talks about how his new venger begin uh, is flourishing mm -hmm. and then he say and he exp uh, he describes the brutality mm -hmm. that he is done to the mm -hmm. cops mm -hmm. he's like he would crush the burnt yeah. bones and remove the gold he would break the skulls he would crush wrists it's very gory and uh, it's it's very brutal in one sense but at the very next line itself he is exp he is describing the gentleness of bima yes. like in the evening he would go to karla sell the gold and collect the cash and on the way home he would get dates for narbada business mm -hmm, was ready mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh you can see a fatherly instinct fatherly love yeah. in him yeah. and a murderous a murderer um, you cannot call him a murderer but still the brutality is yes, very evident absolutely absolutely i'm glad you pointed this uh, uh very um instinctive response to this uh, passage when you see the scenario it feels surreal yeah. it doesn't feel uh, real at all right um he comes across a, a, a bit of gold on a corpse and then suddenly he makes it in into a business right um the next uh, sentence is that he had found a new means by which to live right and he starts visiting crematoriums and sometimes um uh, the narrator says that um the gold ornaments which were left on bodies used to enter the bones yeah. so he has to crush the bones to get at the gold so what what we have here is a very stark gory uh, gothic um, picture of bima a powerful figure he's he's burly uh, he's very powerful fear he's just crushing the bones of these dead bodies to get at the gold right so um it feels so brutal and the narrator himself or herself makes a comment here saying that the brutal reality of unemployment had made him brutal so he has been turned into this animal by the way things are in, in this society it's unemployment it's just Poverty. a small uh, concept that we can easily understand right unemployment everybody can understand you don't get work if you don't get work you'll be hungry and then the narrator says that such, that kind of behavior will make you brutal yes. will turn into an animal and he scavenges he yeah. scavenges for gold right he's like an animal here hyena like uh, you know that kind of idea is kind of placed here on our minds a uh, very subtly um at the very beginning of the story so what he does is he does all these crushing of the rest breaking of the skulls yes these are dead bodies but we still understand the horror of it Yes. right and it also tells you the hidden inhumanity uh it, that is kind of um kind of trained on him so he's been trained to behave in such inhuman ways and we also need to see this as a concept right a, a concept of brutality a symbol as well his actions become a symbol too um just as the way the rich and the powerful the money lenders the landlords behave brutally they may not literally break wrists they may not literally smash skulls uh, they may not literally crush your bones but they're doing it in a symbolic way in order to exploit you and kind of cushion their lifestyle right that uh, symbolic brutality is here uh, eerily turned into a real brutality which uh, bima inflicts on uh, dead corpses so in a way he could be taking his vengeance on this dead money lender when he wants to get at the uh, cop so it's 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 a, a very reasonable interpretation to make and uh, once again um, we can see him bringing back dates for narmada uh, narbada and business was steady yes. right things are normal things are good for him and we don't see him um, conscience stricken that is completely elided there is no uh, repugnance 
there is no revulsion. So he has been hardened uh, by the realities around him to completely go scavenge, to go find his business among uh, the dead bodies in the cemeteries. So uh, he is not uh, at all uh, kind of uh, made repugnant by what he is doing. Yeah, so that is uh, interesting to me. Kurla is uh, a neighborhood of East Mumbai. Um, that's their reference. And the uh, Varna River, it's a, a tributary of Krishna River. Uh, the reference to Varna earlier on page 107. Um, okay, so um, then uh, I would uh, like to thank the both of you for joining me. And let me invite two other students to uh, unpack the story further. Uh, the sun had set, darkness covered the land. As his wife served his meal, Bhima ate in grim silence. When she realized that he was preparing to go out, she said softly, You're going somewhere, aren't you? I don't think what you're doing is right. You should find some other way to make a living. Copses, copses, ashes, gold, this existence, it's all wrong. People brand. Bhima was, was upset by what his wife was saying. Be quiet, he said irritably. How does it matter what I do? If my home fires go cold, who's going to come and light them up? It's not like that, she said quietly, noticing her husband's angry face. It's not good to roam around like some ghoul or ghost. I'm saying whatever I'm saying. I'm saying whatever it is I'm saying because I'm afraid. Who told you that there are ghosts in graveyards? Listen, this Mumbai is a ghost's bazaar. The real ghosts say stay in houses and the dead ones rot in those graveyards. Ghosts take birth in the village, not in the wild, raved Bhima. In the face of his anger, she kept her mouth shut as she made preparations to leave. He growled. I didn't get work even after going to Mumbai, but sifting through corpses' ashes, I've got gold. When I broke hills, they gave me two rupees, but now that ash easily gives me even ten rupees. Saying this, he left the house. It was quite late by then. It was quiet and peaceful outside. Okay, thank you. A remarkable set of ideas here. Uh, once again, the contrast is very, very clearly brought about uh, by uh, Bhima. What are your thoughts? I, I mean, starting from the end, it says it was quiet and peaceful outside, which yes. is uh, yes. not at all indicative of things to come. Absolutely, um, um, which kind of takes us back to the point that Catherine was earlier making the about setting, the, yeah. the, the contrast between the soft, um, you know, uh, the softness mm -hmm. of the world outside and the harsh realities of uh, the world mm -hmm. um, that Bhima knows. Um, yeah. So that, uh, that contrast is there. What else is there? I mean, it, it's not just Bhima, his wife seems to know it as well. She, she's quite aware of what he's doing. Yes and she tries to dissuade him very yeah. very softly but she i'd like to posit that she also sees sense in what he's saying that if they have no money what's going to happen to them absolutely absolutely and this is another uh, way of living although she's not in full agreement with it it does bring home yeah the so yeah so uh, if you go back to that uh, idea first um, I don't think what you're doing is right. So she somehow seems to be like the conscience of the family. She somehow seems to be the conscience of Bhima, which he suppresses very harshly. He says, you don't know uh, if, if the lights go out, if the kitchen fires go out, who's going to come and light them up, right? So, uh, but we can also see her voice as the voice of reason too. The voice of reasons, the voice of the conscience, the voice of the traditional attitudes of society. You should not disturb the dead. That's what uh, mm -hmm. we are told to believe, right? So that kind of attitude is also brought to the fore by um, his wife. And she says, um, what I'm saying, uh, I am saying because I'm afraid. I'm frightened yeah. because she's worried that things will turn on the family. You know, uh, you know, uh, there might be some kind of repercussions for to what he is doing. And look at his response. Who told you that there are ghosts in the graveyards? The ghosts are not in the graveyards, but in the villages, in the towns, right? Uh, and he says that this Mumbai is a ghost bazaar, bazaar, um, you know, where there's a lot of crowd. Once again, people living very closely to one another. Um, there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of economic activity. But he says that they are all run by ghosts, not real people, not civilized people, not people who are alive, mm -hmm. alive both to the needs of the others, mm -hmm. right? So the real ghosts stay in houses and the dead ones rot in the graveyard. So all people, he just tarnishes everybody with the brush saying that everybody is a ghost ghosts take birth in the village not in the wild so he says that the real ghosts are in the village and and 
but this w idea will be kind of turned mm -hmm. upside down as we read the story uh, further. And um, once again, the point here uh, that I want to draw attention to is the fact that Mumbai is figured as uh, a place of ghosts. Yeah. Right? So that, that uh, representation of the city in such a light is very, very uh, harsh and intriguing and is made, uh, you know, uh, made sense of by Bhima. He makes sense of this ghost bazaar, right? Uh, what else is um, interesting here? Once again, the irritation versus softness idea is yeah. there. Uh, the uh, irritability that he kind of um, offers in the in the face of softness of the wife, right? Yeah. And I'm also reminded of Charles Dickens as our mutual friend. Uh, isn't that the novel where we have uh, a father figure trying to fish up dead bodies in the river, and he makes a living out of selling those corpses to yeah. scientists to doctors, That's right? Awesome. And the doctor says, "Please don't do it. This is not right." So same kind of idea is kind of brought to the fore here yeah. too. Isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, Suma, would you like to offer your thoughts um, on uh, any of the sections? So after, uh, like, uh, Bhima is uh, digging up the corpses mm -hmm. for, uh, like, gold, we see that, again, it's like, you know, you shouldn't disturb the dead. So you have this uh, bizarre happenings in the, around, around the place. And you notice that the corpse of the young daughter-in-law of a money lender has been moving around mysteriously in the burial ground. And so this is one thing that we should, uh, you know, have a, you should keep it in mind. And uh, then you can see that, uh, so Bhima again goes back, I mean, he knows all this and he's going back uh, to the burial ground for, you know, gold. And uh, so he's, ha he, it was pitch dark, but he felt no fear. A sari, one petticoat and a blouse, dates in the morning was all he had on his mind. He was in wild mood today. So it seemed as if, you know, he was very logically thinking that, you know, when a female is allowed to move into the public space. So it's something like he's like, no, I won't see. It's like it's only something that is to be seen in the day. And I think it's something. Yeah, let me uh, let me just comment on that. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting passage that you have picked out for discussion. Um, it was pitch dark, but he had no fear. He, in, in fact, likes darkness. He invites darkness, right? Which is why he kind of glares at the sky, hoping that it will be dark soon. And and uh, uh, he is um, uh, he's happy when there is darkness so that he can get his business done. But the point here is that a sari, one petticoat, and a blouse dates in the morning. So these are the things that he wants to arrange for his family in the morning after he has successfully robbed the corpse of the money lender. And sold it and um, you know so these are the plans that he has right for his wife and the uh, and the daughter so what he's trying to do here is that even though his profession is bizarre uh, it's really cruel and brutal he is trying to recreate a domestic happiness for himself and his family right so once again uh, we have two really uh, you know uh, two very different worlds um, that Bhima is kind of crossing from one to the other. One world is the world of graveyard, the other world is the world of his family where he wants to provide for his wife. Look at the reference to the coin necklace. He wants to provide um, not only the basic necessities, he wants to make the wife happy. He wants to give her jewelry, right? He wants to bring dates because dates is perhaps a delicacy um, that you don't usually get. So it's a special thing that he wants to give to the daughter because she uh, likes it. So the domestic charm um, that he, we kind of uh, see a glimpse of the charm that he has in his mind uh, for the family is is really kind of gives us the humane um, you know side to Bhima there he is brutal but he's not brutal towards his family that that uh, thing is something that we cannot forget right and I wanted to point um, do you have something else uh, yes yeah. please. so I think there is a clear uh, cut blurring of boundaries between life and death yeah because uh, the instance where the gold is suffused into the bones. Yes, yes. I think very good. That's a very uh, symbolic moment. Something which doesn't show death and life as two separate things. Yeah. The material and something. The organic and the inorganic yeah, kind of 
coming together, blending together. Yes. But I would um, interpret it in a, in a different way, more cynical way, and say that you know the greed has gone into the bones of the human beings. You know, you become so inhuman when you become so greedy, right? And and you have to kind of hack at the bones, hack at the flesh and the bones to get to what you want. And once again, I'm reminded of that uh, fairy tale, the goose that lays the golden eggs, right? Um, they're not satisfied with one egg per day. They just want to kill the goose. And two peasants killing the goose to get at all the golden eggs is somehow very horrifying, um, you know? So I'm also reminded of that uh, narrative of greed. So um, you point to a very interesting point about the blending of the organic and the inorganic. And I think about the dehumanizing, how gold eats the bones and the minds of the people. So uh, that aspect is also there, right? We need to remember several uh, trajectories when we uh, analyze uh, text uh, in this fashion. Anything that we want to add? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you very much, Shweta, and thank you, Suma. Mm -hmm.